everyone, my name is Jenna, but you guys can call me Jen. Welcome to my channel, welcome back to my channel. Hi, hello, you're very loved and you're welcome here. It is Thursday today, happy Thursday. I guess technically it is Friday because it's almost 1 a.m., but it's Thursday. I still have one day left of work ahead of me, but I wanted to start this vlog now, which is usually a weekend vlog, but I wanted to start now because I have started the weekend vlogging activities now. It's another 24 hour readathon, baby. And we are doing a timer led one. So I wanted to start it a little bit early so that I have enough time throughout my days to actually finish and commit and do the things and read all the things for the 24 hours, you know? I did take a clip earlier. It was like right in the B-roll at the beginning of the books that I am hoping to dabble in potentially. I got a couple of library books. I got three books on my actual TBR that I would really like to get to, but as you noticed, they are very thick and chunky boy. So I don't know if two of those will be read in, in its entirety, and I don't know which one I'm gonna start with. And I also have, of course, these to get through because I am currently on page 352 of Kingdom of Copper and I'm trying to get these done for my series series number four vlog as you guys know so I have that so I would like to one numero uno finish this hopefully I can finish this tomorrow with the timer led situation I have been reading for 40 minutes already so I got a good chunk of reading in in those 40 minutes of this bad boy so once that's done then I will scooch over and and, and I think I'll ignore The Empire of Gold for the weekend. And I want to kind of dive into some of the other books for the 24 hour reads on, see, see how much I can get read during the 24 hours, etc., etc. All that good stuff. We got Jonathan Strange. We got God Killer by Hannah Kainer, which is a very tiny little short little book. Is it though? Like it looks so small, but I looked at the audiobook and it's like 12 hours long, which is very long for a little itty bitty guy. But I figured if I wanted like, a short could be done in th four hours type of vibe. I could pop that one off. Um, and then I have a book without an audiobook, which is The Book of Disappearance by Ibtisam Azem. And then I have On Halstein by Noam Chomsky, which I say wrong every time I mention it, which is a nonfiction book, but it is also very, very, very short. So I think I might squeeze that in because as you guys know, I have also been working my way through the Hundred Years War on Palestine. I am just over halfway through now. I'm like 54% of the way through because I've been listening to it as a podcast when I make dinner and stuff. And it's been great to do. I think I've just, I'm just starting chapter four. So there's not much of it left for me to get through. And because it covers six events in Palestinian history. I think I'm gonna do On Palestine by Noam Chomsky. Um, as part of this readathon at some point. But yeah, the little baby books that I can get through alongside the big chunky boys, which are Jonathan Strange, as I mentioned, and then Old Ordinary Monsters. I really want to get to both of those. So who's to say what's going to happen this weekend? But I know what's going to happen. Numero Uno is going to be a lot of writing, a lot of reading. <laughs> what a Freudian slip. Because I also should do some writing at some point, which is why I wanted to start this readathon a little early as well and like have Thursday and Friday in it. And possibly Monday, depending on if I have like an hour or something to cover on Monday when I actually finish this vlog. But I would like to see how much I could get read. I also want to, you know, take a few breaks and stuff like that. And in those breaks, get some writing done because it is still NaNoWriMo. <laughs> well, it's the 17th of November now. And I have not done what I wanted to do this week, which was get through part two. I've barely started part two. So really the goal is just to get something written this weekend, something. And think about what's gonna happen in part two, you know? <laughs> Anyways, welcome to the vlog. Other than all this reading and a little bit of writing, I have nothing planned for this weekend. It is also the Grey Cup this weekend. And I know my parents are gonna wanna have me over to like eat something, so. Sunday will be something. That's the weekend ahead of us, my friends. Let's see how much we can get read. I don't know how much I've read already. Let me see. As I said, about 40 minutes. We were on page 295, starting chapter 18, and I've read to 354, chapter 22. So I read this chunk of the book in the 40 minutes that I was reading for, which is pretty good for 40 minutes. So hopefully I can polish the rest of this off in just a couple hours tomorrow finish this, update the vlog for that, and then doing, do, do the, do the more 24 hour readathon stuff. But yeah, that's the plan. That's the goal. Welcome to the weekend. I hope you guys are doing well. I'm gonna go to bed because I have to work tomorrow. I'll catch you tomorrow for like the official first day of this, but like low key.
So I did it. <laughs> See you tomorrow. Happy Friday. It is just about 10 p.m. I have just over 20 hours left to go. 20 hours and 28 minutes left to go in this read-a-thon. I have been reading since seven. So I've gotten two hours down. Finished The Kingdom of Copper. Holy fuck. And low key, I'm now mad that I said I wasn't gonna jump into Empire of Gold because I really just wanna jump into Empire of Gold. <laughs> but like, I have all these books that I also really want to get to. But I understand, like, my, my brain was like, yeah, let's put the two biggest books on my TBR other than The Day of Fallen Night for a readathon. <laughs> for a 24 hour readathon. How many pages is this? This is over a thousand pages. Oh my god, the writing is so tiny. Oh my god, there's footnotes. I feel like this is not a readathon book. <laughs> telling myself that now. How about Ordinary Monsters? What are you at? Okay, you're at like a solid 630 pages. These are much more readathon books. I'm still baffled at this book. And so I don't have words for this book. It was that good and that stressful. The last half of this book, I was sitting on the edge of my fucking seat just like gently getting more and more stressed the entire way through this. This was so much better than The City of Brass too. Like, the City of Brass is a good solid fantasy book, but this one? Holy fuck, that was good. Oh my god, what the fuck? <laughs> I love when second books come in with a punch, take everything that we've learned in the first book, and kind of take it and go, great, you all know this, you all know the world, wonderful, guess what? And throw it away and they're like, you don't! And they just raise the stakes, they throw more lore at you, shits hit the fan in so many different ways and you're just stressed. That is how you're supposed to write a second book in a trilogy. Oh my Christ. Like the only one I can think about that did this like this was The Hunger of the Gods by John Gwynn which is the second book in that trilogy. Like the way that that one was masterfully crafted. Like this is a master craft and a second book in a series. Like, I don't even, wow. Just wow, holy fuck. Holy fuck. I don't have any other words than that. <laughs> oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> I think I need to take a little bit of a break from reading to like come down from this high and then decide what I'm gonna read next. Whether I'm gonna start in on a big chunky boy, one of these two little boys, or maybe this, this one is a four hour audiobook still, like even at three times speed. So like this isn't little, so we'll see. You know when you read a book and you can only just scream at how good it was? That's, that's, that was this one. Oh my God. Oh my Christ. Oh my God. Oh my god. Okay, so there is no audiobook for this one, The Book of Disappearance. So I think I might try and get through this one tonight because it's only 10 and the writing is really big on the page and it's only just over 200 pages long. So I think I can get through this in a couple hours, hopefully, depending on how dense it is. I don't think it's gonna be very dense though because as I said, the writing is pretty big. Let me, let me take, let me, let me divulge with you what this book is about. This is called The Book of Disappearance. There's the full title. The Book of Disappearance. There we go. <laughs> it's Tissam Azem. It's a Palestinian novelist and journalist. So she originally wrote this in Arabic and it was translated by Sinan Antun, who, let me just double check, is a poet, novelist, and translator. He holds degrees from Baghdad, Georgetown, and Harvard whoa where he specializes in arabic language okay so this is a palestinian novel that asks the question what if all the palestinians in israel simply disappeared one day what would happen next so this is a story about that disappearance and then it follows two different narrators allah a young palestinian man who is conversing with his dead grandmother in the journal he left behind when he disappeared and his jewish neighbor Ariel, who found this journal and who is a journalist as, as he's trying to understand this traumatic event. 
and it's like these two perspectives. The novel stages a confrontation between two memories. This is gonna be very interesting. This is gonna be very interesting. Ariel's search for clues to the secret of the collective disappearance and his reaction to it intimately reveal the fissures at the heart of the Palestinian question. This is gonna be so fantastic. So apparently it is a little bit magical realism. I'm looking at this blurb from Molly Crabapple. It says, using a magical realism as cool and lacerating as that of Borges. Azem builds the story of a young Israeli journalist and his vanished Palestinian friend into a devastating exploration of the Nakba, betrayal, erasure, and love of home. I'm ready. But before I dive into this, I'm not ready because I need to get I need to get over the kingdom of copper a little bit. I'm going to clean because I got a few things out and I'm going to chill before I start my next book and start the timer up again. But yeah, I switched over to the stopwatch method because I looked at my phone and the 40 minutes that I had read from yesterday had been erased from my phone. Love that. My phone's timer, so we're going to work off of the timer on my watch and we're working down. So, 20 hours left. And we're just gonna keep working down <laughs> and hopefully it stays. What, what an evening, what an evening, holy shit. Hello friends, happy Saturday. I'm contemplating popcorn. You ever just contemplate popcorn before? <laughs> it's been a day. It has been an interesting day. I woke up this morning, decided to do a closet cleanup, which is good because I had a bunch of clothes like sitting in my closet from last year's closet clean out. So half of it was just me pulling that out and putting that on my bed and then going through all my hanging clothes. And then later I went through my, my sweaters, but I didn't really get rid of many through all my hanging clothes and getting rid of some of them as well because I had so many clothes on the floor here. And look, my floor is clean now. Iconic. It hasn't been clean for months. I had so many clothes here and in my laundry room that I was just like, they need homes, you know? They now have homes. And I can put my bags on the floor like they're supposed to be and it not be just a trap of clothes at the bottom. <laughs> so uh, that was really great. And now I just have a lineup, as you can tell. Just a lineup of clothing. I think some of my friends are coming by tomorrow to peruse through it just to see if there's anything they want. And then I'm gonna take it to the local thrift store <laughs> to get rid of, to donate. Cause I was thinking of bringing it to a place like Play-Doh's or something where they pay you for the clothes. But then I was like, ah, you know what? As a bigger girl, going to the thrift store always sucks if I'm looking for clothes specifically because there ain't nothing ever in my size. And when, when there is like the off chance there is, like once I showed up and there was someone who had gotten rid of her like entire 
jeans and pants collection from the store that I shop at in the size that I used to get. Fuck, it was the best day of my life. <laughs> it was so great. I wanna do that and I'll bring all my plus size clothes to the thrift store for the thrift store to do with as they wish. <sighs> I just need to get them out of my life, you know? <laughs> just need to get it out of my life. Um, but anyways, after that, I've contemplated enough and want popcorn. <laughs> After that, I've just been reading. While I was doing the closet clean out, I ended up reading almost the entirety of On Palestine by Noam Chomsky and Ilan Pape, which I don't know. <laughs> I don't really know about it. It's not what I expected going in. I figured it would be more like a typical nonfiction, like analysis of what's going on. And it, it is, but it's presented as a like discussion between three men, between Noam and Ilan and Frank Barrett, what's his name? Frank Barrett, yeah, who isn't anywhere on the cover, which I find interesting, like he's the editor of this, he should be on the cover. So it's this conversation, like it, it, it opens with an introduction from Frank, explaining a few things, and saying that this is a like follow-up to the the acclaimed book by Noam and Ilan called Gaza and Crisis because they realized that they had more to say. <laughs> and then it is literally just a discussion. Like it's questions posed by Frank and then it's answered by Noam and Ilan and like literally in question and answer form. And it kind of, I don't know, like it was an interesting conversation, but it meandered a little bit. And, and it, I'm not a nonfiction girly, so it really wasn't for me, but I think it was still a very important read to do because as I was reading this, this was written in 2014, I think, before the uh, the introduction was written in. Yeah, Frank Barrett wrote, wrote his introduction to this in September 2014. And at the time that they were writing this, Gaza was being carpet bombed, which it's being carpet bombed now. So, you know, timely as shit. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, I don't rate my nonfictions. I, they just don't fall, I don't read them enough to have a rating system for them. And they just don't fall in the same realm as fiction books for me at all. So I'm not gonna rate that one. And then last night I also read the entirety of the Book of Disappearance by Ibtisam Azem. And this was really interesting, like genuinely really interesting of a book. I, oh, so I explained what it was about yesterday. So we don't, only get the two narrators. We don't only get Allah, who is the Palestinian man being, like his his voice is being heard through journal journal entries and his journal that he that was left behind in the disappearance. And then we don't only get Ariel, his Israeli neighbor. We also get other people in the moments of the disappearance. Uh, or the moments after. We don't actually see the disappearance happen. We just see the moments after. And it was very cinematic in that way. And also very Mrs. Dalloway, which is such an interesting <laughs> comparison, but this is very Mrs. Dalloway. So I struggled with the writing in this because yes, it was translated, but I've read books translated from Arabic before and those books are beautifully written. And this was choppy. It wasn't well translated because there were some sentences that straight up did not make sense. Like they did not make sense at all. Like I couldn't even make sense of them in my head with my editor brain. I was like, what is happening here? So that was interesting. What the author was trying to do with the two main POVs with Allah's journal entries and Ariel's like current narration of the disappearance and stuff like that was very intriguing. That, like what she was trying to do with that, the author, mm, very intriguing because with Allah's journal entries, they really feel like journal entries. Like it feels like an entirely different person writing those things. And it is so stream of consciousness. It is just, it's baffling. Like it's a full on conversation with his grandma and questions he's asking and and all this time, like stream of consciousness just rolling through these these journal entries and then you get to the aerial povs or just like the regular third person pov it reads more it reads easier to me than the stream of consciousness from the journal entries i think it was really interestingly posed to have the narrator who doesn't have an active voice but has like words being read on a page so they were like words on a page aren't being actively said right like if someone's talking to you or living those moments 
words on a page have already happened, right? I think it's very interesting that Ibtissam chose to have the Palestinian voice in here be the inactive voice and yet have it be the most important voice because it is what helps the active voice, aka Ariel, who's living out the moment of the disappearance and as a journalist and whatever in the 48 hours. This is literally only 48 hours after the disappearance of all the Palestinian people. And it's him living through it and having the active voices in the moment be Israelis and getting all of the points of view on the disappearance through being a newscaster, not a newscaster, he's a journalist, through being a journalist, getting interviews by, from people, hearing other people talk to him, like his, his Israeli friends like calling him up in the moments right after his ex showing up and being worried about him, all this kind of stuff. And then him slowly kind of crumbling his idea of the world that he's living in through reading his disappeared Palestinian friend slash neighbor's journal where his friend slash neighbor is talking to his dead grandma. So it's like this chain of reading, like interacting with someone who isn't there to interact with you back. It's, it's so interesting. Like I almost want to read this again. I almost want to get a copy of it and read it again because there's so much going on in this tiny little book. Like this is the second book now I've read in the past two months that there's so much happening in this tiny little book that it makes me want to reread it. Like it was this one and Minor Detail. And I think this one is very interesting to me because Minor Detail is, it has some very, very negative opinions about Israelis for very valid reasons, obviously. If you've read that book, you, you know why. Very negative views on the Israelis. And and I was reading a review earlier about on Palestine that gave it a one star and I was like immediately when I saw the one star I'm like, oh here we go, you know? Thinking it was gonna be just like this person who was just mad. And they were just mad, but they did bring up the fact that this is just a discussion on what Israel is doing wrong. And it's not really about Palestine itself. So it's about the Israeli prop like occupation. It's not really about Palestine. So it was one of those things. So it, it's, it kind of gives you not the wrong idea, but it kind of sets up something in that. I don't know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I don't know what I'm trying to say, but like minor detail kind of had that negative tone that this most definitely has, where it's a very huge critique on Israel, which is so valid and needed and all that kind of stuff. But it doesn't give us a picture of what being a Palestinian is. Minor detail definitely did. It definitely gave an image of what being a Palestinian is in, in, more modern day Rafa, I believe that's where it was set. This one was very interesting to me because not only did we kind of not really get to understand or know our Palestinian narrator because he was so preoccupied with talking about his grandma and the city and the history and so stuck in the past that we didn't really get to know him at all, him as a character at all. We only really get to see the impact his words have on the Israeli man left behind. I think it was a very interesting choice to have your more more main character be Israeli in this situation. Oh, this was fascinating. This was fascinating. If you guys have read this, please let me know what you think. It's definitely not as magical realism as I wanted it to be. <laughs> As a fantasy girl, you guys know, but I, I did I did enjoy the read. I also then started Ordinary Monsters. I put up a poll on my Instagram asking which tome I should start. I started reading Ordinary Monsters and I'm about 80, 88 pages in. I'm just about to start in chapter five. It's called And Brighter Still over here. And then I was listening to that on audiobook as well while I was making dinner, all kind of stuff. And then I stopped for a break and watched an episode of Burroughs End on Dimension 20. I've watched the first episode and then the first episode of Adventuring Party as well. And I low-key just want to dive right into that and watch that forever because it's so good already. Love that. But then I'm like, <laughs> I kind of fell out of wanting to read Ordinary Monsters, which is interesting. Like I'm, I feel like I should give it another hour of reading time just to see if I can get a better chunk done of it. And then I pulled another book off my shelf that's little and it's Untethered Sky by Fonda Lee because I feel like I need <laughs> the serotonin crush of finishing a tiny novella <laughs> in one sitting, you know? I feel like I need that right now. But I have that and then I always, I saw this, this tome sitting on my table and I was like, what if I, what if I read this? 
<laughs> so that's a possibility, but I don't know what I want to read. So I think for now, I'm going to get back into Ordinary Monsters. I'm going to make the popcorn that I pulled out. Get back into Ordinary Monsters, get another hour done of reading, I think. I don't know how long we, we are in this for. Let's me. Let me check. So we have 13 hours, 25 minutes, and 5 seconds left. So I would love to get this well below, like around 10 hours or more or further for tomorrow so that I don't have as much to read tomorrow as long because I know I'm going over to mom and dad's for dinner. Um, so that's gonna, you know, carve a little bit out of my reading time. And I know my friends are coming over after that to like look at the clothing. <laughs> so I just don't wanna be super stuck with it. If I read for another, Three, four hours tonight i would be happy so we'll see get another hour read of ordinary monsters see how it goes and then try untethered sky by fonda lee and then we'll see where we're at and we'll see how i'm feeling with reading of whether i need to change the vibe and dive into something different or not but three books down incredible I look like I have a helmet of curly hair in this light. <laughs> it's not far off. <laughs> With that, it is almost 3 a.m. <laughs> I am tired, but I have finished another book and got to the halfway mark of Ordinary Monsters. So, I'd love to see it. And I think I have less than nine hours left to go, which should be okay tomorrow to carve through. And if I have an extra few hours to catch up on on Monday, I don't mind. I can read when I get home from piano, but another book down. I'll tell you more about Untethered Sky tomorrow. I'm tired. I'm going to bed. friends happy sunday i am here my friends just left yelani and alexander came over and raided my clothes that i was getting rid of <laughs> which is awesome i've never been able to share clothes with people before because i am so much larger than all my friends i have always been so much bigger like i think my mom stopped being able to share clothes with me when i was in fourth grade and then she just kept like taking my clothes <laughs> And then now if she takes my clothes, it's always, oh my gosh, I'm just swimming in it. You know, the very confident boosting words from my five foot four mother. <laughs> but I've never really been able to share clothes with people before. And even now, like I'm not really sharing clothes with them, but I just, it makes me feel good inside that my friends took a lot of my clothes. They like, they were very excited to come and peruse and I got rid of a lot of sweaters, which is always lovely. And yeah, they're huge on my friends, but like, that's what they wanted. They wanted the oversized. And I'm like, I'm glad to be of service. <laughs> it is pretty much the end of the day, I do believe. It's about 10. <laughs> and I want to pop and say, hey, I haven't talked to you all day. I also have reading updates. <laughs> so of course I do. I didn't end up going to mom and dad's for dinner. Mom, mom and dad called me this morning and mom has a cold. So <laughs> I didn't want to be sick. I didn't want to become sick. So I didn't go over. And uh, she got it from dad because he had a cold because he was traveling all last week and I didn't want to catch it. I didn't want to be the next person to catch it. So I didn't go over for dinner. 
and said I just stayed at home and I've been reading all day. <laughs> I did get the like hankering like partway through the day. I was like, I really should write something, but I just didn't, I kept battling with myself. I'm like, I'm doing a 24 hour readathon. And if I take the time out to write, I'm not gonna have enough time to read today. So it was an interesting dichotomy, but I didn't get any writing done this weekend, which is fine. You know what, this week I'm gonna like get back into the groove of it and hopefully get good progress done on the draft. Cause that's really was my only goal this November, this NaNoWriMo to get good progress done. I still have a goal of finishing the draft by the end of December, which I think is gonna be easier to do because once teaching stops for the holidays, I have all the time in the world. And then my office is closed for a week between Christmas and New Year's. So I have all that time as well to just relax and get words down if I need it. So we'll see how that goes, but on reading news. Okay, so so far in this readathon, we have finished four books. I finished the end of Kingdom of Copper, which blew me out of the water, <laughs> still thinking about it. And then I guess so far, like the books that I have finished completely in this readathon have been these three little ones. So we had, of course, The Book of Disappearance, which I've talked to you guys about already. And then we have On Palestine, also talked to you guys about. And then yesterday, once I had reached the halfway mark of Ordinary Monsters, I decided to take a break. It was like 1 a.m. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna read this because the audiobook on script is three hours long. And if I listen to it at three times speed, I can get through it in like an hour. So I did. And the only thought I have coming out of this is, wow, this is just magical horse girl book. <laughs> which is so mean because <laughs> that's all it really was. Like our main character really had no substance to her. She just was so enamored with her bird and like everything revolved around her bird. She loved it so much, whatever, whatever. I think I'm one of the only people who doesn't really love Fonda Lee's work that much. I really, really liked Jade City, sort of like Jade War and didn't really love Jade Legacy. Like they're good books. They just didn't do it for me. I don't really have any attachment to her writing. And this was fine. It was just fine. Like it wasn't bad. It wasn't awful. But I think it would have been a really interesting novel idea if she had actually fleshed it out a little bit more. Because a lot of the reviews on Goodreads are just, it was too short. And I think for what Fonda Lee was trying to do with this, it was the perfect length, in my opinion. Like any longer and I would have been bored. More bored than I was reading it. <laughs> for the hour that I did. But I think that's just a side effect of the fact that it's a novella. And some authors are better at writing novellas than other authors. Like Fonda Lee, this is I think her first novella that has been published. I could be wrong, definitely correct me if I'm wrong. But like Jade War, Jade City, and Jade Legacy are huge, epic fantasy books. It's interesting to go from that to this and have like a very contained little story just in like 100 pages. How many pages was this? 150 pages, you know? I think it's, I think writing a novella takes exceptional skill that a lot of people don't have. I personally do not have this skill because I overwrite everything. And I find it very, very, very difficult to write really short stuff. So like, it's a feat to be able to do it and have a contained narrative, but this was just fine. I read it, <laughs> so it was a book and it was vaguely, it was definitely very horse girl. <laughs> but for birds. <laughs> anyway, so I realized also that I haven't told you anything about Ordinary Monsters by J.M. Muro. This book is good. It's not giving me the, the vibes I wanted. I don't know. Like when I picked this up and I was reading the flap and it was England, 1882 in Victorian London. And I'm like, let's fucking go. Give me this drippy atmospheric gas lamp lit fantasy that's kind of like Oliver Twist-esque and, and that kind of stuff. And it, 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 it is, it is, I guess. But, and, and I am liking it. It's just not like giving me the atmospheric vibes that I thought it was going to. So it's not the November book that I was hoping, that I was thinking it was for so long. You know, because I kept saying like, this is a November book and I will only read this in November. It is November and I'm reading it in November, but like now that I'm reading it, it's not a November book. <laughs> like it doesn't give me those vibes as much as I wanted it to. I feel like Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell will, because that's like a, a leaky, slow, urban-y type of fantasy. 
I think what I really wanted for it to give was what a lot of my university classics gave, which is like reading Edgar Allan Poe's Dupin and Sherlock Holmes and Oliver Twist and Dracula. Like those all, and Picture of Dorian Gray. Like those books all have very specific vibes. And I was wanting to find a modern version of that with this. And I thought I was going to get it. Have I read anything that gives me that vibe recently? I don't know if I have. But yeah, I was like kind of hoping for a little bit more of a atmospheric dreary. And like it is like it's set in 18 in the 1800s, in the 1880s, in London and in the Americas and in Scotland. It has that, but it's just not giving the atmospheric vibes. I don't know if that makes any sense. I think that's very mood reader of me to say. <laughs> Okay, so this follows the story about two orphaned children who have special abilities, but we don't really get to them until a little way in. So it kind of also follows the people around them and them. And then the story of this bad guy who's hunting them and that kind of stuff for what they can do because they have very specific powers. So it is about Marlo, who is this little boy. The very first chapter is about a woman who is running away from her employer who finds Marlo as a baby in the arms of his dead, she assumes, mother. And so she takes him and like raises him as her own. And that's where she meets Brent, who is this very, very large American woman who was a wrestler and is tattooed like crazy who is following this reverend around, a very interesting band of people. And so they like raise the boy for a number of years and then the reverend dies when the boy is six. And then around this time, the mother like is suspected of murder because she did murder her previous employer. She's on the run from his father and his father has like a bounty out for her kind of a thing because she murdered him because he was raping her. So it was this whole thing that she like ran from that murder scene. And so, in this moment, like she gets found out by a bounty hunter. Something happens to the bounty hunter, but she decides like, I'm gonna go turn myself in or I can't be with my kid anymore. She decides that she can't be around these people anymore, like Brent and, and the boy, because she doesn't wanna put them in danger. So she leaves Then it's just Brent and Marlo. And Brent and Marlo somehow make it to the Americas at some point. But anyway, so that's one story. And then we also, find this mixed boy named Charlie who has been accused of murder and they've tried to execute him number a number of times and he just won't stay dead because he has a regenerative power like he has been hurt so many times but he has not a single scar on his body this poor boy has been honestly tortured and then it's the two people who are from the Cairndale Institute which is this school type place that these kids have like, with special powers are taken to to be trained and stuff like that so it's it's got like the school narrative to it but we i'm halfway through the book and we are only just now at the school because like the first half is like understanding this atmosphere and that kind of stuff then these two detectives coming from scotland and finding the two boys yeah so <laughs> i was looking at reviews when i put this into goodreads and a lot of people have like not negative reviews, but they're not shining reviews. Like, you know when you open up a review on Goodreads and it's like, if it's a really, really well-loved book, it's like the, the, the reviews, the previews of the reviews you get are very like five and four star vibe. And then some books get like two, three stars that are like the previews and you're like, ooh, this is not a well-loved book kind of a thing. This one opens up with like three and four stars. And a lot of people are like, this was a mess of a book but I see what the author's trying to do. And I got through to the end of it because of Marlo, the little boy, that was worth it. And I still can't stop thinking about it. And a lot of people are saying that it's too long because it's over 600 pages long. It's a tome and it's a slog and whatever, but I am halfway through and I am enjoying it. Like yesterday I was only gonna read it for another hour and I ended up reading it for another three and get got to the midway point because I was just, I would just lost myself in the story, which was so great today. I didn't want to read this at all. I didn't want to pick it back up again because <laughs> not that I won't pick it up again ever. Like I just wasn't in the mood to read it today. This is the mood reader in me because I saw this Robin Hobb ship of magic and I told myself I wasn't going to read it. And then today I was like, but what if I just read it? <laughs> so I restarted it because the, the first hundred pages that I read, I read back at the beginning of October. So I remember absolutely nothing from it. Um, so I went back, reread the first hundred pages and then kept going and now I'm this far through and I cannot stop. Like my friends came over and I literally had to like finish the page and like pull myself out of the story because 
I'm in the mood for a Robin Hobb. This is so fucking good. So I'm thriving. So this is the first book in her Live Ship Traders trilogy. So her Realm of the Elderlings, <laughs> vast and wide. And the first trilogy follows Fitz. It's called the Farseer trilogy. And that's where you have the Assassin's Apprentice, the Royal Assassin, and then Assassin's Quest. And I read that trilogy earlier this year. This trilogy has nothing to do with Fitz. It's an entirely different part of the six duchies and it's pirates and I'm thriving. But when I read the first hundred pages of this, I wasn't into it. Like I just couldn't fall into the world, into these new characters kind of a thing. But now that I really wanted to pick up a Robin Hobb and I am doing it, I'm thriving. I love like the slower fantasy, the build, cause I can, I just know that Robin Hobb is just gonna build an epic story with these characters. But this one, instead of following just one person, follows many, many people. So it follows Althea Vestret, who is the family of old, old trader, they call themselves old traders, who owns a live ship named Vivacia or Vivacia or something like that. And Vivacia has just been newly awakened because of the death of her father. Like that kind of just happened in here. And then what she expects to happen with this death of her father doesn't happen. So it follows Althea. It also follows the ship hand who was her father's first mate. I can't remember his name, Bration or something. It also follows a ruthless pirate lord, Kennet. And it also follows, like it follows a number of people who are all intertwined in this. And I'm thriving, I'm thriving. This is my first multi POV Robin Hobb and I'm really loving it. Anyways, it is just past 10 and I have three hours and 43 minutes to go. So I'm gonna keep reading and see how far I get in Ship of Magic because I think this is what I'm gonna focus on for the rest of the day. But I don't, I'm definitely not gonna finish this book in three hours because I think the audiobook has like nine hours left at the speed that I'm listening to it at at this point because this is another like 800 page book. Yeah, this is 800 pages, this little baby pocketbook. So we'll see how long that gets me, but I think I've done pretty well <laughs> with finishing so far four books and then reading 200, 300 actually, because how many pages is this? Yeah, I ended on page 319 of the Ordinary Monsters book and then however many pages I'm gonna get through of this because I am already on page 284. So another few hours reading of this and then I will catch up with you when that's done. Hello friends, it is almost 1 a.m. Oh my God, how is it almost 1 a.m.? Don't like that. I have one hour and 40 minutes left. <laughs> It'll be 2.30 by the time my readathon is officially done. I just wanted to come in and say I'm halfway through Ship of Magic. I fucking love this book. It's great. I'm thriving. This is was such a good idea <laughs> to do this today. I I don't know about you guys. I sometimes find it rare when I'm in a mood reading mood where I know exactly what kind of book I want to read. And did I know what kind of book I want to read today? No, but I knew exactly which book I did want to read. And so I let myself fall into that because a lot of the times when I'm in a mood to read, I don't know what I want to read, you know? It's one of those things where I just like, I'm like, I don't even know what I'm in the mood for, but I'm not in the mood for this or this or this or this or this. Like that's kind of a thing Or like, sometimes I'll wake up and I'll be like, I'm specifically in the mood for this kind of book today. And then the next day I'm like, I'm not in the mood for that. I'll never be in the mood for that again. A lot of that happens as a mood reader, which is why I have developed a very terrible habit of wanting to finish fantasy books in one sitting, especially large fantasy books that are upwards of 500, 600 pages, which is not possible for a lot of times, but it is possible at my, uh, absolutely insane audiobook listening speeds <laughs> which is why I can do things like finish Forged by Blood and um Ebony Gate which I did last last week in the same day because I was listening to both of those audiobooks at like 3.5 speed just shoot through I didn't finish those in the same day I read Ebony Gate in one day started Forged by Blood and then finished it the next day but you know what I mean like I'm 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 the kind of person who I need to, sometimes when I'm in the mood for a specific fantasy book, I need to finish it in one day. Otherwise I might not be in that mood again. And then it ruins my enjoyment of the book, which is such a terrible place to be. Because when I was a kid, I used to be able to enjoy books and read them for days and weeks. And just every time I was picking up the books, I was enjoying it as much as I started it or more. I wish I could get back to that. And I think what really gets me and what really helps me do that is reading really long fantasy books because I know I can't finish an 800 page book in a day. Honestly, I pr I, I take that back. I probably could have if I had started this really, really early <laughs> today instead of at like 3 p.m. like I started it today. I only started reading at like 3 p.m. which is why I'm 
taking this readathon into 2 a.m. vibes. But yeah, so in some cases, being a mood reader, this is my whole point of this long rambly shit. In some cases of being a mood reader, following that mood hits exactly right. And this is one of those moments. Like I was sitting here today, I didn't want to go back into Ordinary Monsters. It was just one of those things where I ended up just being like, I saw Ship of Magic. I put the little seed in my head last night about reading this one. Today when I was up, I just kind of got this like hankering. I was like, what if I just read Robin Hobb? Like Robin Hobb's slower, delicious fantasy. I really want that right now. Like I didn't want to go into another gas lamp fantasy moment with this. I kind of want to let this one sit a little bit and come back to it this week and or next weekend. Mm, no, I want to finish it before next weekend because I have reading plans for next weekend sitting on my piano. There's like eight books stacked there, which is too many books for one weekend, but it's there anyways. But the fact that my body and my mind and my soul were like, Robin Hobb though? Robin Hobb though. <laughs> and so I was like, yes, restarted it. Now we're here. I'm halfway through. I am thriving, but I'm going to keep most of my thoughts about this book for my specific Live Ship Traders reading vlog because I am also filming a reading vlog for this. But yeah, I'm thriving. Honestly, like it's giving the Lies of Locke Lamora meets Darkwater Daughter with Robin Hobb at the center of it. What? I could not ask for a better vibe. Like the world is giving Lies of Locke Lamora. The ships and the piratiness is giving Darkwater Daughter mixed together with the wonderfulness that is Robin Hobb's world building and characters and just slow churning wonderful. Mm, stunning. Anyways, I'm gonna close up shop and get ready for bed and then keep reading this until 2.30 a.m. Because that is when we're cutting it off. All right, friends. I'll see you then. Happy Monday. We've officially reached the end of this vlog. What a day! What a weekend! There are so many things that I read this weekend. Let me go through them real quick because I know you've been here for a while. I read over 1600 pages today. I did the math. Did I say today? I meant this weekend. That's how many pages I read this weekend. 1600 pages. Oh my god. <laughs> so we started off the weekend finishing Kingdom of Copper by S.A. Chakraborty. I'm giving this four and a half stars. I absolutely freaking loved it. I cannot wait to read The Empire of Gold. Oh man, I'm so excited. Then I dove into two Palestinian books. I read Book of Disappearance by Ibtissam Azem, and then I read On Palestine by Noam Chomsky and Alain Pape. And I did look this up today, and I don't think the authors are Palestinian. I know for sure that Ilan Pape is Israeli. I couldn't find anything about Noam Chomsky other than he is American. So I feel like... <laughs> I don't think either of these people are Palestinian, but it is a book about Palestine and the Palestinian issue and history and all that kind of stuff. So read this one. I didn't say I gave the book a disappearance, three and a half stars, but I do low key want to get myself a copy and I and annotate it, reread it and get like kind of like study it more because I feel like this is a book that I could have written a paper about in university. It's just, there's just so much going on in here that I just want to think about and reread and like decode, you know? It's one of those books. I started Ordinary Monsters by J.M. Miro and I got 319 pages in. Oh, I didn't tell you like page counts and stuff. I think I, I think it was 225 pages to finish this bad boy. And then each of these were about 215 pages a piece. And then I read The Untethered Sky by Fonda Lee. I gave this two and a half stars. It's just a horse girl book with nothing going on. I really, I honestly like the more I think about it, the less I liked it. 150 pages down with this one. Glad it's off my TBR. But yeah, so the two books that I'm in the middle of still, 319 pages into Ordinary Monsters by J.M. Miro. I'm on chapter 19 called House of Glass. I am enjoying it so far. Yep, I talked about it enough in this video. <laughs> 
I am enjoying it. I'm intrigued to see where the last half of the book goes and like what actually happens in the book and whether that makes me intrigued enough to continue with the trilogy because it is a trilogy, I think. And then I read Room for Magic, or I most of it anyways, 60% of it, <laughs> with 524 pages down in A Ship of Magic by Robin Hobb. And oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, what a book, what a book, what a book. Oh, thriving. 1600 pages. I am baffled. Baffled? 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 Baffled. This was my weekend. Can you believe it? 1600 pages read, four books finished, two halfway through roughly. Generally pretty good time. You know, what a good weekend. Didn't get any writing done like I wanted to, but that's okay. I got a whole whack ton of reading done and that's awesome. <laughs> Anyways, my friends, I think I'm going to leave it here. Thank you so, so much for watching and hanging out with me this weekend. I hope you're doing well. Let me know down below if you've read any of these books or if you've added any to your TBR now that you've seen me read them and talk about them. Thanks for sticking around, my friends. I will catch you in another one very, very soon. Stay kind and keep on reading.